Hello, it's great to finally be bringing archives to your town. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hello, Kayama. It's fabulous to be with you, at least virtually. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. A particular welcome to Jessica from Kayama Library and the people joining us who are there with her. This is how we got here. One of New South Wales State Archives strategies is to engage across the state through our regional network and touring exhibitions. And Archives on Tour is another way where we can really focus in on regional New South Wales. Archives on Tour started in 2018-19 when we took the 1828 census on a bit of a tour around New South Wales to celebrate its inscription on the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Register. And then in 20, for 2019-2020, we decided to take parts of the six big series of archives that cover the whole state to six different towns across New South Wales. Well, we all know what happened then. COVID disrupted many, many plans, including archives in your town. What we thought with archives in your town is that at the heart of every town are people and buildings, and that we hold in the state archives archives about people and buildings all across the state. The archives cover a huge range of subjects and perspectives. So we're virtually bringing you those archives about the people and buildings of Kayama. We'll talk about the series of archives and how you can find them on our website and how to access the archives. There'll be time for you to share your memories and knowledge and ask us questions. Out of the literally millions, and I mean literally millions of archives, we've picked just a few to show. Archives in your town has its own pages on our website, so you can browse the digital versions of the archives we talk about at your own pace later. Well and truly worth a look. So where are we going and where have we been? So we went out west, then headed up the coast of Tween Heads, and now we've come down the coast to Kayama, and we'll be finishing up with Wagga. We've worked with the staff from Kayama Library, and I want to thank them for being so willing to be involved. They've suggested some of the people and buildings and provided some background information. I'm sure that Rebecca will be joining in the chat today. We're recording the whole of the webinar, as Fiona said, but we won't be using your questions and comments. There'll be a bit of editing going on as we go through. These are the series of archives we'll be looking at. We'll pause after looking at the archives about buildings. So have your memories and questions ready, and then we'll have a time for questions at the end too. So we're starting with NRS 3829, the school files that cover 1876 to 1979, so over a century of information. The school files were created by bringing together all of the correspondence about each school. And it's from everyone, teachers, parents, education department, the district officers and other government departments, the local members of parliaments, the department of uh, the education ministers. They show how schools worked, but they also show how schools interacted with the community. So Emily is going to take us behind the scenes to have a look at a school file. So in this file on Durham Bar School, we start with the application. And there's actually an inspector's report talking about the establishment of the school, explaining where Durumba is. So it's on the Tweed River, talking about it being a, for, a farming community, good land and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, people listed in the local community who would promote the local school. Uh, we've got a list of how many students might, might be expected to attend. We've got a map of the school district and where the residents who have children might be living. A lot of correspondence about teachers. They almost feel a little bit like a personnel file when these things didn't exist. 
Um, here for this teacher, William Tashihi, we've actually got a list of his previous employment and comments to do with his promotions and things like that from 1896 back to 1889. We've got a list of families, number of children who were supposed to attend the school and why they weren't attending often due to the weather or being ill or one because they had a sore foot. Here from 1897 we have um, William Sheehy resigning this time due to his charge of obscene language in the local billiard room and the inquiry that ensued correspondence to do with the school site so talking in 1901 about dedicating two acres as a site for the public school there's a copy of the portion plan the crown plan and there's the two acres that they're going to dedicate for this school so the files are listed in our online schools and related records index. They're just called administrative files and they cover those years 1876 to 1939, 1940 to 1979. You can also pick them up through the catalogue so you can pre-order them for the reading room. Because of their varying size, we don't offer them through the copy order service, but it is something you need to come into the reading room to have a look at. And because there's so much material about teachers and other, other aspects of the school, they work really nicely in hand with the teacher's career cards and the teacher's roles. They work nicely with the school photographs and they also work together with our admission registers, punishment books, and the other resources that we've got from some public schools in New South Wales. So only public schools. Um, but well worth a look if you're researching the history of a local community because so often the school is the community and the community is the school. Let's look at some of the schools from your area. So two of these schools are still open and interestingly a second Minamara school opened in 1976. The similarities between all of the school files, they reflect their times. Both world wars, but particularly World War I. Women having to resign if they marry. The depressions that have happened across the state. And expanding and decreasing populations. But they also reflect their town. As Kayama grows in population and area, so does the need for schools within Kayama rather than outside Kayama, and the need for bigger schools as well. Some files are up to 15 boxes of papers. Some are only a couple of centimetres thick. The file for Kayama Public School is over half a metre of paper. So I've selected a very small quantity of papers from each of these schools. They've been digitised and put on the Kayama Archives in your town page, and we'll just look at a few of those pages now. So this is from Kayama Public School. It opened over 10 years before the school's files started in 1875, so it's not surprising that by 1878 repairs are needed. And then on the right hand side, it's not, well, it's really common for school files to show teachers being moved from school to school, but rarely are so many moved at one time. So there's a complete swapping around of people in that local area, presumably to get a better balance of teachers to teach the subjects that were needed. So Mr. McClelland, who was a teacher in 1890, uh, 1878 at Coma had worked out a way for children that had to help with their milking to miss less of their schooling. So there was actually an hour and a half break in the middle of the day, but by trimming that to an hour and starting a little bit later and finishing a little bit earlier, it meant children were not losing quite as much time. And once he'd explained why he'd changed the school routine, he was allowed to continue with that. Mr. McClelland was replaced by Mr. Fletcher and they had some difficulty in arranging the move out and into the school residence, because as you can imagine, you're not quite ready to leave the school residence until you're ready to leave. And if the person's arrived to take over on the same day, very difficult. And you'll notice down the 
bottom that Mr Fletcher was refused um, expenses and one of the reasons was that he'd requested the move and that Kaima was a better school than Watson's Bay so he should not ask for expenses. Kramer had evening schools at two different times. Now evening schools were something that the Department of Public Instruction had created in 1880. And they were designed to provide an elementary education for persons over 14 years of age who'd previously received little to no education. They offered young men, because very few females ever enrolled, two hours of instruction three nights a week. They were usually conducted in the public school building by the headmaster. Most of the schools traditionally were poorly attended and sometimes didn't last very long. This list shows the interested young men in 1880 and it does seem to have ended quite soon after it started. But of course, what this gives us is the people in the town because you get the name of the person, Sir William Walker. He's 19, he's a cabinet maker and his father's name is Robert Walker. So a list of people in that age group, what they're doing, what professions there are in town, who their fathers are. Fabulous information about Kayama. The residence for the school teacher was a continuing problem in Kayama, particularly I'd imagine for the resident teacher and their family. So when these renovations were being planned, the inspector said the changes suggested by the teacher, and that's their purple work as to what should be done, would render the house comfortable, which it is not at present but they were not considered urgent enough to be carried out. The school residents still being raised as a problem in 1895, where the chief inspector, or the inspector is saying that they've inspected this residence. It's in a very bad repair inside. The building is a very old one. The rooms are very small and inconvenient. And it is in fact, one of the most inferior residences in the district. And you can see that plan up the top where they show the old residence and a possible location for new residence, but of course also the school and where it sits in Kaima and note the fairly unusual spell, well, I think it's an unusual spelling of Minamara. In 1899, a group of parents petitioned for a South Kaima school to be established. So you can see up the top of the plan, the little blue dot, which is Kaima school, and then there's a red Square, which is where they wanted the second school to be. And so this map formed part of the petition. The local inspector writes a report on every petition and you can see part of that report on the left where he's saying that basically it's only a mile and a half from Kayama. It's two and a half miles from Amiga Retreat. That's here. Um, the schools provide sufficient accommodation for all of the school children and basically 25 of the 31 students that might be enrolled at this new school were already attending existing schools. So the petition wasn't successful. In 1908, Kaima got a second evening school. These again, these great lists of the potential students and what they were doing at the time. So David Smith, who was 19, was a bread, bread carter, um, signature of, uh, I think it's actually Mrs. Smith. We notice that there are some people who obviously don't have family in the area, but are still interested in increasing their education, which is fantastic. In 1912, the evening school was still going and had some girls attending evening school, which was providing them with an opportunity of fitting themselves for a branch of the public service. It's an absolutely great letter from the teacher. It talks about the fact that they are highly respected local young ladies whose age ranges from 20 to 25 years. Most of these young men attending have been pupils with them at the day school in the past. They come together and leave likewise and certainly their presence for has a good effect on the conduct of the men at the school. The problem for the teacher is that it's so unusual for women to be attending evening schools that the form that he has to fill out to be paid for teaching it has no capacity for him to record that they are there. But they said that that could be got over and so hopefully they continued and potentially as he said they 
might qualify to teach at small country schools or to become telephone attendants. When teachers did move between schools, and that was quite frequent, they were allowed to um, make a request for expenses. This is Mr Drew, who's an assistant teacher, and he was moving from Singleton to Coma in 1909 with three tonnes of possessions. It's a fascinating list of the sorts of things that a person in, I guess, a probably a comparatively well-paid profession had. Um, sideboard, which is 700 weights, dining room suite, eight chairs and two couches, two tables. They have a sewing machine. I'm assuming that it's not just Mr. Drew himself. I presume it's Mr. Drew plus a family. But nonetheless, that's not travelling light. From the 20th century, here are two contrasting accommodation stories about Kaimea Public School. In 1947, on the left, the headmasters decided to open a kindergarten class. There's enough children for that to be possible and he's now got a trained teacher to do it as well. But he has no space. So there's no classroom or other accommodation available. I've tentatively placed the kindergarten class in the Presbyterian Sunday School Hall, which is adjacent to the school and eminently suitable for a classroom. They were still teaching kindergarten in the Presbyterian Sunday School Hall up until 1955. And then on the right hand side, the Premier of New South Wales opened the new library and classroom block at Coma Public School. And it was to be named after Stephen Frew, a former principal who died while still a principal there in 1971. And if you have a look at the copies on our webpage, there's um, a copy of the um, order of what was happening at that official opening. So now moving to Minamara Public School, a much smaller school. But like Kayamara, it started before the school files, only a couple of years after. It was called Peterborough for the first 24 years of its life. And by 1878, the school building was neither wind nor watertight and typically housed 60 children. The schoolroom was so small compared to the number of pupils that part of the wall between the room which served as a residence was moved to provide more space, which of course meant that the teacher had no residence. Oh, you can see a letter from the teacher at the time, Mr Richardson applying for a rent allowance as he had no one, nowhere to live and was standard for the Department of Education in most cases to provide a residence. And you'll see then on the map that here's the site of the present school, the one that's so small and not watertight. Um, and planned new school with the new residence on the other side of the road. In 1879, the level of attendance at Minamara was dropping to the point where the school might reduce to a lower class of school, which would have an impact on the teachers Possibly he would be moved or have to take a lower salary. So Mr Bolton, the teacher at the time, wrote a detailed letter regarding the numbers. There are four reasons why this attendance was low. The first was the local shows. That 20 children were kept at home in consequence of Kayama's show. I presume not kept at home, but probably at the show. And 11 more were absent on the second day of the Berry show. During wet weather, and that's actually a reoccurring theme throughout the school files, that I think the roads were particularly difficult around Minamara. We think about where it is. And in wet weather, children were often not sent to school. The third reason is sickness. One family of four children being kept at home for a past five weeks in consequence of having typhoid. And three other children are delicate and are often not at school. Also, some students had left the district. So he's just making the point that in ordinary circumstances, he probably would make the average of 30, which is what was required to stay as a public school. Minamara Public School closed in 1907. Obviously, the numbers had dropped that low. The school file continues as both the school building and the residence continued to be used. So on the left, you can see the council, that Albion Park Council is 
seeking to use the unused public school building as a polling booth, a use that we're really used to public schools being put to today. The school residence was actually rented from the time that the school closed well into the 1930s, initially by the headmaster who'd retired and then by Mr. Graham, who had lived there from 1918 through to 1931. So presumably it suited him. There were two petitions during that time period to reopen the school, but neither were successful. We're now in the Bombo Public School, so quite close to Kayama. There was a petition for a school at Bombo put together in 1889, and there were 22 boys and 30 girls who may attend. So again, this is from the inspector's report about the petition. Where he's saying that the people are engaged in the stone quarry trade and the government hold a long lease of the place and constant employment is ensured. At present, the population of the locality is about 60. And if, as is likely, as well as can be judged, to increase materially over time. So he's of the opinion that this place deserves special consideration from the circumstances that there is a school for the people nearer than Kayama. And partly because even though it's only it's less than two miles, or it's only two miles, the roads are rough, hilly and dangerous. And that they should get their own school. And also, and this was one of the things that did happen from time to time, that a community could actually provide the school building and then the Department of Public Instruction would just provide the teacher. And so they were successful and the school opened in 1889. And this map gives you an idea of the location. So here we are, this is Sakayama School. It's two miles down to the Bombo School. I suspect this is as the crow flies to Minamara and there was another small school at Croom. But unfortunately only four years later it closed as the quarry closed, which I guess was always going to be the risk. So I recommend that the school at Bombay be closed for the date, from the date of Mr. McPhee's retirement, who was the, head, the schoolmaster there. Now the school's been considered to be within easing walkie distance of Kaima's Superior Public School, so the children would go there. Just over 12 months later, there was a new petition to have the school reopened. So the quarry had reopened, this time being let from the government to a private consortium to do that. In part, they're saying that the children can't walk the two miles. The winter is coming and depression. We are not in a position either to clothe them or to put boots on their feet. The majority of the children are not able to walk the distance. Apart from that, we have two dangerous lagoons where two little boys were nearly drowned, but for the timely arrival of a carter. So in the 1890s, there was a depression across basically the whole of Australia, which was a really severe depression. And here are the list of the children or the families. So you can see at the top, the Francis and Clarice had four children aged 10, seven, six, and five. The petition was successful and the school reopened and they even got a new school building. The school, which was the only public building in Bombo, became basically a social centre for, for that area and was used for a range of events. So in 1919, they were applying for the Bombo residents, for, or the Bombo residents for permission to use the school building one evening for the purpose of tendering a welcome to all of the Bombo returned soldiers. And it was to take the form of a banquet and a presentation of medals, and that was approved. And then in 1934, again, and the reason it was approved in part was because there is no public hall that a well-known member of the community was moving and they wanted to have a social function to farewell her. And again, that was approved. The Anzac Day March in Sydney in 1838 was a really big and special event and it formed a special part of what was the sesquicentenary celebrations. The government provided free transport for returned service people from rural areas. Large contingents came by ship from New Zealand to take part and I think it was about 400 people came up from Victoria to take part as well. 
The headmaster of Bombo at the time was a returned soldier teacher and he was applying for the special leave that had been granted for the day after Anzac Day. And could he take that so that he could attend the march? Now to the Kramer High School. So there'd been agitation for a number of years regarding the establishment of a high school at Kayama, and you'll see that generally in the public school records. Kayama Public School itself had been a superior public school from 1890 to 1916, and then a central school from 1944 until 53, both of which were designed to provide at least post-primary education, particularly vocational courses like commercial, home science or junior technical. This agreement across the whole area would have helped, I'm sure, for them to consider that Coma was a good place for a second high school rather than there being competing interests. But it was still five years before a separate high school opened. This is a fantastic summary from the high school file from 1949 and provides a good view over all of the schools in the area. Um, so Bombo until last year was a fifth class school, quite probable in the post-war period where great public works will require the use of blue metal that the quarries will all be reopened and the school population will rise accordingly. Jarrah, one mile across two paddocks to the road along which the Jambru Como bus runs. I've often walked the distance myself. Um, Shell Harbour. Though many of the townspeople look more to Wollongong as a bigger centre, and there is now so little petrol, because this is in post, immediate post-war years, Coma would be much more convenient for school children. At the present, they have to catch a bus to the station, which is several miles from town, and then catch the train to Wollongong. Whereas Dion, a Wollongong bus proprietor, runs a bus from Wollongong to Kayama, which passes through the town and reaches Kayama at 9am. So just in these two pages, there's so much information about the town, and the other towns. And the other thing I just want to mention, I don't really think of Kaima as being the far south. Perhaps it's the far south of that particular educational district. But you can see they're just fantastic records. So how do you find the school files? You go to our website, records.nsw.gov.au, click on online indexes in the quick links box on the homepage, click on S for schools, click on schools in the list of topics, scroll down to the schools and related records index, click on search the index, type the name of the school in the search box and press enter. And as Emily said in our behind the scenes video, the school files are listed as administrative files. We're gonna look at plans of public buildings next. So NRS 4335 covers public buildings. So buildings that are government buildings. All of these buildings are often large and enduring, even if their purposes change over time. And there are many purposes, as you'll see in this behind the scenes video with Emily. And you'll also see some of our more unusual storage area as well. of these in our collection and 438 of them have been digitised and you can find the digitised copies in collection search. The plans are of all sorts of public buildings from all over New South Wales, so things like police stations, courthouses, jails, public schools, public buildings like lands offices, post offices, some of those big buildings that you might know in the city like the Registrar General's office, the Colonial Secretary's building and the Treasury buildings are all included in these plans. But there are some plans that are closed to public access if they're of a security building like a jail or a police station or a courthouse that is still operating as a jail, police station or a courthouse, for example. So we do hold plans of Long Bay Jail and those plans are still closed to public access because Long Bay Jail still operates as a jail. And some of those very old country police stations, as another example, where the police are still inhabiting the building, those ones would be closed. But there are a lot that are open to public access.
let's now look at some Kaima public buildings. Kaima hospitals opened in 1930. We've got a couple of plans for it. This plan is from 1927 and shows the main block. When you look at it on the web page, you'll see the amazing detail around this main entrance where they've even got the initials on the doors. This is from the isolation block. So this is from 1929. So it's and it's labelled additions to the isolation block. So presumably either quite away into the building or post the erection of that isolation block, they've changed it. So there's a good layout showing the verandas, the wards, the duty room. So in some ways, not dissimilar to the sort of hospital ward. In some ways, not dissimilar to the sort of hospital ward you'll see today. This plan has seen better days, but it still has a lot of detail about the pilot's quarters in 1902. So uh, putting addition, an addition on here, you can see it down here. So it's a bedroom and a bathroom, which opens off the sitting room. And it shows you in quite a bit of detail, the outline of the actual quarters, where it sits on that block of land, and in a variety of sections, how it's going to look. So you can find the plans of public buildings on our website. There's two ways to search. You can just type in the series number in RS4335 in a town name into collection search, and that will bring up the plans that are listed there. There's also an online index, and you can go through the quick links box again. It's under A for architecture and design. Click on search and type in this town name and you'll get a range of records, both plans and also some correspondence. Some of the plans are digitised and available to view online, but not all of the plans are listed online. So if there's a particular building that you're interested in, you can use our Ask an Archivist inquiry service to see if we hold them. The last of our buildings are the theatres and public halls. And the series covers 1895 to 1992, again, a really long period of time. So these are actually private buildings. And the reason the files exist was because they had to be licensed. And the licensing was really around the public safety aspect. These files provide information about local businesses, both in relation to the theatres and public halls, which are indeed local businesses, but also the building industry. You'll also see fire and fire brigade, the police and fire brigades playing a role in inspections. And the theatres and the public halls are such a large part of recreation in any town. And the rise and fall of these buildings chart changes in population, but also in the broader world of recreation and how that takes place. So Emily is going to take you behind the scenes and show you one of these files. Here today what we've got is the file for the Capitol Theatre in Wagga. This file starts in 1929 when they were thinking about building the theatre and it carries all the way up to 1966 when they were thinking of pulling it down to put a coals over the top of it. A proposal to build an A-grade theatre at Wagga it's talking about the location of the site and why it's such a good site um, and also the plans for what they intended to build on the site. So they were looking at that stage at, to accommodate up to 1500 people um, and saying that the site faced Gurwood Street. The police have been asked to provide a report. They're inspecting public premises as well. So another evidence of other work that they did. Um, here we've got more of a fire inspection, looking at the different appliances and where they were. Here we go, we've got blueprints of the heating arrangements.
Then here we've got details about how often they could show pictures here. So every night from sun Monday to Saturday and a matinee twice a week um, and no other uses for the licensed premises in question. So it was just to be used for the movies really, this one. We've got some lovely letterheads going through. And one interesting thing that happens with these, that some of these theatres and public halls start off as individual halls or theatres that over time were taken over and became part of a chain that might be through one particular area. Here is the plan of the faculty centre. The lounge seats and the dress circle seats. and a stage. Some of these theatres would have been used for schools and other organisations as well. Sometimes public halls were actually used to house, house classrooms as towns expanded. Um, and so you can see some evidence of that. Um, here we've got a letter informing the authorities that the, the name was going to change from JK Capital Theatres to Hoyt's Country Theatres Proprietary Limited. So and the file continues onwards to 1965, 1966. And at that time, the theatre was closed down as it was sold in 1965 by Hoyts, which we can see here uh, was GJ Coles and they were going to build a supermarket at that location. Theatres and public halls from Kayama. Again, these are just some of the pages we've digitised. We've only digitised parts of the theatres and public halls files because they're often quite substantial. So the first hall we're looking at is the Old Fellows Hall, and it's old, or it was old. It was in 1895, which is when this form of licensing commences, it's already got a licence, and you can see that this uh, very brief letter is signed by MN and Marsh. And then we have two fantastic plans from the mid 1920s. So it had two floors. The lower floor, as you can see, had a supper room with a ladies' cloakroom and a gents' cloakroom, and also the all important fire exits. Upstairs were the entrances off Terralong Street, a gallery for seating upstairs, an empty space downstairs in front of the stage. So could be multi-purpose, it could have seating placed in there. And you can see at the back that there are dressing rooms behind the stage. The height from the floor to the ceiling is 30 feet. So that's quite tall. It continued on mostly being used as a picture theatre and a whole range of other things, as you can see in this. So this is 1955 and the police have been asked to make a report on some issues that have been raised about it. It's towards the end of its career and it was worn and in need of repair. I have to report that in relation to the matter of fine dust coming off the floor whilst persons are dancing, um, this police officer has been approached by several patrons who have complained about the floor and they've shown me their clothes after having danced on it for some time and it makes the clothes a dirty colour and I kind of picture this poor local police officer probably at the dance and people choosing just in his private time come and complain. Floors masonite and the dust is caused by the masonite wearing when danced on. The supper room is basically from the details here well below standard. Women preparing supper cannot leave it there overnight owing to the fact that rats are prevalent and eat the food. It's also damp and inclined to be dusty because there's no lining between the dance floor upstairs and the supper room. Um, so complaints on both. But as he also says, the Odd Fellows Hall is the only dance hall in Kaima. This is in 1955. And if it was passed as not fit to be licensed in its present state, it would mean that bodies designed hog balls, etc., in Kaima would not be able to do so. But unfortunately, before it could be passed unfit, um, it was let to a local organisation in 1956 and ceased to function as a public hall. And in 1959, it became the Group 7 Leagues Club. So now we're in what started as the Atrium Theatre and later became the Kayama Picture Theatre. So Mr Carson, 
and obviously decided he wanted to set up a picture theatre and went at it without doing enough checking first. So we'd spoken to the police and been referred to the Public Theatres and Public Halls Act. Um, but the police officer hadn't realised that he was about to start building hall, which he literally did. So foundations were commenced and they've been doing work for about a week and there's about $50 worth of work done. And during this time, I've not been out on duty as I've been lame and did not see the work going on. So Mr Carson's now going to get a copy of the plans prepared, which will submit to the minister with as little delay as possible. And the police officer has warned him, um, Sergeant Second Class, that he really would be continuing at his own risk. So this is a plan of it, which is very simple. So it was on Manning Street. It was a rectangular shape. There was a court on one side beside a park. So good for exiting, which is always important. This report from the architect provides much more detail than the plan does. And it talks about the size of the site with the 60 foot frontage onto Manning Street, be classed under grade C, and that would be fine. The size of the stage, there's gonna be a gallery of 50 foot by 27 feet, right in front over shops and vestibule. Um, the shops will be fine because they're going to be completely cut off from the licensed premises, are fire resistant construction throughout. Um, so from examination of the plan and specification the building will be suitable for public entertainments and subject to a satisfactory police report at completion and the carrying out of the items in the attached list, there would be no objection to the granting of a license under grade C. And there seems to have been, with this theatre, but also with the fellows hall, a continual so are inspected regularly by the police, a list of things that needed to be fixed and worked on. Here on the left, we've got a police report from 1938 by Fred Dibden. This is a little bit unusual. I suspect it was a particular request. So the name of the premises by then is Kaima Cinema and the licensee is Thomas Henry O'Brien. Pictures are held approximately four times per week during the past six months. And for dancers, it's approximately one per month. But even after 30 years in business, there were still issues with safety. So in 1952, when it was inspected, the country resident inspector um, found that the stage draperies, maskings, etc., being subject to a flame test, were found to be free burning. You would often find on these theatres and public halls an actual section of the screen which was sent in to prove that it was made of a suitably flame retardant material. And there's an image of that in the file, which is on our archives in your town web page. In 1955, the Chamber of Commerce, so Coima's Chamber of Commerce, had raised some issues with the Chief Secretary in relation to the Coima Picture Theatre at Coima. And this after the Chief Secretary having spoken to the locals and then this is a reply. So the things they were concerned about were matinees for children. And in essence, the answer is that they did hold them occasionally, but generally wasn't sufficient support to permit the proprietors to give regular Saturday afternoon performances. There was apparently really poor reception during rainy weather and the licensees were going to see if they could put in another ceiling, which would help with that. And the seating apparently was uncomfortable. I'd be fascinated to know if anyone in Kaima can remember the seating in this theatre and was it uncomfortable and also the quality of the show that was being shown. So generally the same as those exhibited at Port Kembla and other coastal towns and are of a fair average variety. It also suggests that if the Chamber of Commerce wanted to make suggestions that possibly they could write to the department you could then pass that information on to the licensees. So if you're looking for a theatre and public hall, really simple. Go to our website, records.nsw.gov.au, type in the series number, NRS 15318, and a town name. So all of the files are listed online, and for somewhere like home, you'll probably find there's 20 or more files, sometimes two files per theatre. None of the files are digitised, so you would need to come here to view them.
So one of the great things about the bankruptcy files, and this is often true, I think, of an archive, someone becoming bankrupt is not obviously a good thing for them and for the people that they owed money to. But a bankrupt person provides a statement about why they became bankrupt. And that often provides a picture of what's happening in the town and beyond the town. The files of bankrupt people in a town collectively can show you the sorts of businesses that were operating in the town. They contain list of creditors showing money that was owed and debtors that owed money to the bankrupt. So through these lists, they show great commercial connections in a town, between towns and with Sydney. So the bankruptcy files cover 1888 to 1929. And Emily's going to take us behind the scenes and show us a bankruptcy file. So we hold quite a good collection of bankruptcy files. They cover from 1888 up to 1928. This particular file I've got in front of me is for a man called Elijah Alexander who went bankrupt in Broken Hill in the 1890s. So the files contain a lot of repetitive material because at the base it's really about how much money was owed by the bankrupt and how much money could they get back from their creditors and give their debtors. Okay, so usually there's a statement on the file to where the bankrupt gets a chance to explain what led up to their current unfortunate situation. So he says he was recently the licensee of the Freemasons Hotel at Broken Hill and he's the bankrupt. He filed a statement of his affairs with the registrar in Sydney and he goes through a list of creditors that owe him money. He says he was insolvent previously in 1881. He attributes his bankruptcy to sickness in the family and the drought in 1891-92 um, and the Broken Hill strikes by which his house was boycotted and also losses on a contract to provide food for free labourers on the mines during the strikes. Um, he had three partners and he he and his partners lost £670 by a contract. Due to a range of issues with the partnership, he took possession of the hotel in 1891. Um, he gave the company £1,036 in cash and then proceeded to spend quite a bit of money on the hotel. Had to value all the furniture and effects in the hotel. He says he's been out of employment since the whole thing started and we do remember too that in 1891 there was also a depression so I'm sure that did not help matters at all. So here we've got a lot of creditors unsecured um, and the kinds of people who were creditors were brewers and merchants and wine merchants, tea merchants, chaff merchants. We've got debts to the estate some of these people, or possibly most of these people, might be people who just owed the hotel money for drinking debts, perhaps. Uh, so there's quite a people working at the proprietary mine who all owed like one and two pounds, three pounds sometimes. Here we have a list of goods that were bought of Alex Marshall, the wholesale and family butcher in Broken Hill, prime beef. And looking through it, we Notice that there's a lot of cooked beef, there's mutton, there's raw beef, mints, giving us an idea of what people ate when they went to the hotel in Broken Hill in the 1890s. Huskerson and Co. We've also got food, so things like raisins and vinegar, uh, thyme, flour, rice, oatmeal, quarter of a ton of sugar, would you believe? Sago, turmeric, allspice, 
currants, lots of proofs of debt from various creditors and these sorts of things. Um, as we just saw, the invoices from and the letterheads from the creditors can be quite beautiful pieces of art in themselves. The names of everyone who's got a bankruptcy file in this period are listed in our online indexes and in our catalogue. So you can search for the name and the location of the person. So this is a bankruptcy file for someone from Coma. David Power is described as a storekeeper and livery stable keeper in his bankruptcy file. But he also describes himself as a labourer. And you can see that here. So on the 29th of September 1888, he's formally saying that I can't pay my debts any longer. And so he's made a declaration to the Supreme Court in bankruptcy. And then over here, he's talking about the business of storekeeper carried on by me at Coma aforesaid and managed by my wife during the whole time it was carried on. Um, neither of us kept any books and memoranda beyond a small day book, which has been lodged with the official assignee of my estate together with my bank books. And I would say that I have not any books or papers from which I could make out the required accounts. Um, he provided money, I'd say from his labouring job for to purchase goods for the store and then she ran that. So this is his list of unsecured creditors. And again, as I said, you can see this connections within the town. So there's creditors from Sydney, from Gerringong, from Shell Harbour, Kayama, Gerringong, Kayama. Um, I think there might be Wollongong, Omega, Pitt Street in Sydney. So all of those different sorts of places. It gives you an idea, not in detail, of, and does vary between bankruptcy files. So it's frequently cattle and goods, um, or just goods, the dates and the amounts. So David Power attributed his bankruptcy to not being able to procure work and to bad times. He was in business for four years and most of the debts had been incurred in the previous 18 months. Um, he was owed, or he owed, I should say, owed over £829. So it was really quite a substantial amount of money. He did have some assets. So he had the stock at the store um, and the trade fixtures, fittings, etc. He had um, the dwelling house that it occupied seven horses, eight drays, coach and horses. It was estimated that it, that cost over 500 pounds and they thought they might produce 285 pounds while it was sold. It was only produced 56 pounds. So his, um, the people who he owed money to would not have got very much money back. To find the bankruptcy files, as Emily said, you go to our website, click on online indexes in the quick links box on the home page, and then you can pick B for bankruptcy and click on bankruptcy and insolvency in the list of topics. So we hold the bankruptcy files 1888 to 1929, but we also hold insolvency files, which are a similar sort of file, which cover 1842 to 1887. Click on search the index, and then you can just type in the person's name, or if you're interested in the town, type in the town's name. They're all listed in the index, but none of the files have been digitised other than the ones that we've done for archives in your town. So we're gonna move on to talk about the deceased estate files, which cover 1880 to 1958. These files were really created to decide whether or not death duty would be charged on an estate during this time period. So they're a financial record of the person's estate when they die. And they fantastically have really detailed information about a person's possessions. So Martin is going to take us behind the scenes to have a look at the deceased estate files. Hi everyone, and welcome to this next instalment of our Archives Behind the Scenes videos from New South Wales State Archives. We're in cell 10, 
uh, the famous green cell, not only because it has a green floor and green shelves, but even green labels on all of the boxes that are in here as well. One of the highlights of the State Archives collection that are held in this cell are around 7,000 boxes of deceased estate files from the Stamp Duties Office. These are files that were created when death duty was payable in New South Wales. The series of files dates from 1880 through to the late 1950s, and they are a financial record of someone's estate when they died. So in order to establish how much death duty was payable on an estate, that estate had to be valued in some way. And in order to provide that value, you had to list out and enumerate all of someone's real estate, their personal belongings, and their other personal estate. And that's exactly what these deceased estate files are. They're a financial record, but a real treasure trove of information. Now you can access indexes to the deceased estate files on our website, and also on the websites of our partners, Ancestry and Find My Past. So between those three websites, and our website address is www.records.nsw.gov.au, you should be able to find an entry for anyone that you might be interested in, in the deceased estate files. Anyway, what sort of information do they show? Come a little bit closer and I'll show you an example of one of the files. So this is the file for John Henry Williams, who dies in Sydney in Randwick in 1945. His file typically comprises an overall value of his estate and then the paperwork to do with the administration of his estate and that whole process of enumerating the estate. So page upon page of details of this person's estate. What's really interesting about this example, and it's by no means an unusual example, is the wonderful listing of all of the personal estate that was contained when John Henry Williams died in 1945. So you'll see listings here of furniture, of cushions, of curtains, of glassware, and a value for each item because that's exactly what these files are, remember, is a financial record of someone's estate. So they're a wonderful source of information because they tell you how someone was living at the time of their death and what objects, what estate, what real estate, what personal estate they left when they died. Bye for now. They are fantastic records. The deceased estate files, as Martin said, are for people from all walks of life, men and women, all ages and financial positions. Between them, the deceased estate files and the probate packets that we'll look at next cover the wrap up of a person's estate when they died. The probate packets show what happens to the estate, who inherits, where the deceased estate files are about calculating death duty. There's an overlap between the two series, but always look at both if there are two. They both provide great information about a person and how they live their life. But also about the town the person lived in, what businesses there were, who knew who, who dealt with who, what sort of housing there was. So the three deceased estate files we're going to have a look at, spanning nearly 50 years from the late 1880s to the mid-1930s, are typical of people of their time and their roles. Each of these people both have probate packets, but I haven't necessarily copied them. So the Deceased estate file we're looking at here is for Thomas Tullock, the pilot in coma. Thomas died in 1888 without leaving a will. Mary Tullock, his wife, signed the affidavit. He had no real estate. His estate was worth £128. So basically he had a deposit in the government savings bank and a deposit the coma branch of the commercial savings company of Sydney. The interest on those and then his household furniture and personal effects. He did have some debts. He had a debt of £20 to the Stevenson brothers, presumably a business, and another £9 to Stephen Major. It is This is one of the smaller deceased estates that I've seen. It's really not much, very much more than the affidavit, but even that tells you something about this person and how they live their life. This next estate is of Joseph Weston, a journalist of Coma who died in 1913. So Joseph Weston was the owner of the newspaper, the Coma Independent. Two of his children signed the affidavit. There was some disagreement between the Stamp Duties Office 
and the family about the value of the business of the Kaima Independent. And also there was a printing business as part of that. So you can see on the left, the valuation of the machinery and plant, which put the value at about 265 pounds plus 100 pounds, which was basically the goodwill for the business. And then a reply from um, Alex Campbell, the general auctioneer in Swan Value, who'd done the valuation from the solicitors that the family were using about how he'd arrived at the valuation because there'd been questions from the stamp duties office. So I mean, overall, Joseph Weston's estate was valued at nearly um, 1,700 pounds. The bulk of that was real estate in Kaima and this 265 pounds of plant and goodwill. And then there's a letter from uh, the family solicitors, Ryan and Wheeler, about that valuation, um, where Weaver and Elworth had intimated that the stamp commissioner is dissatisfied with him out being placed. And so there's the discussion about how it's been arrived at, um, a suggestion if it's going to be revalued and preferably not because that's going to cost more money, that they should get someone who perhaps is another newspaper proprietor in the area, which seems to me like a really good idea to do that. These are the debts owed by Joseph Weston and they I think themselves provide a picture of his life and life in coma generally. So he's got a bit of an overdraft, he buys paper and printing material, he buys tobacco, he owes council rates, um, he owes money for a headstone and curving for his wife's grave, I think she'd been dead for less than 10 years, household goods, medical attendance. In both deceased estate files and probate package, you'll often see references of money owed to doctors, hospitals, nurses, because after all, these are files of people who have died. Um, he owes for the gas bill, advertising, paper hanging. Fascinated by two pounds fifteen and five pence for bacon, only bacon, what no other meat. Um, horse hire for paper delivering, groceries, clock repairs, wearing apparel. So a whole picture of the sorts of people who are carrying out these businesses. There's also six pages of small debts owed to Joseph Weston worth £151. And whether it's through the bankruptcy files or the deceased estate files, for people who were basically small businesses, that's quite common. So we're going to look at the deceased estate for, for Robert Kendall, an undertaker in Coma who died in 1933, aged 63. His affidavit signed by his widow and son. The estate's worth over or nearly £1,500. The majority is made up of the home on the Pacific Highway in Kayama, which was worth £660. So the certificate of valuation you can see, these are common throughout deceased estate files and probate packets. That tells you where they were. It was on the west side of the Princess Highway in Kayama. Um, and then down the bottom where it tells us about the improvements. So it's a weatherboard cottage of four rooms, kitchen and outbuild, outhouse, galvanised iron roof, a garage and a shed. I've found that sometimes widows' estates are more useful than their husband to predecease them because the detail is necessarily going to be required because it's all being left to her. So there's a little bit of furniture that is listed. Um, and some stock and tools. And then this is 1933, so I think it's kind of a changeover period. So you, you can see on this is part of the um, affidavit, which is present. So in 33, they're still talking about carriages. So farming implements, harness and saddlery, but Kendall is quite up to date. He's got a motor hearse. And I think interestingly, it also includes a license for the motor hearse and it's worth 105 pounds, unlike his poor watch, which was broken and not worth a great deal of money. So to find the deceased estate files, you can have a look on our website on in the online indexes. 
D for deceased estate, files click on deceased estate, search the index. And again, you could look for a person or you could look for a town name. Our index covers 1880 to 1939, but the files cover 1880 to 1958. So you could look on ancestry.com or on find my pass for that other period. We do have a copy service for these files, so you can order copies for $37.90. So if you like the other part of that package are the probate files. And this is where you'll find the last will if a person left a will. And all of these sorts of, they're much more form based, I think, than the deceased estate files, but they do have that interest because of the will. Not everyone has a probate packet. Depending on this type, size and value of assets located in New South Wales, it may not be necessary to obtain a grant of probate in New South Wales. But Colleen is going to take us behind the scenes and look at a really unusual probate packet as well. Hi and welcome to the latest instalment of Behind the Scenes here at New South Wales State Archives. I'm down here in what we call Stage 5 of our facility, which is where we store one of our most popular record series, the probate packets. Probate packets contain the last will and testament of the person who passed away, as well as other administrative documents around settling of the estate. And as you can see, we've got boxes and boxes of them. In fact, we hold probate from 1817 right up to 1976, as well as a bit of 1989. And the remaining packets are held by the New South Wales Supreme Court. So why are they called packets? Well, as you can see, the New South Wales Supreme Court used to store the documents in these envelopes. But, they're pretty hard to get out sometimes. And in fact, I can't even get the records out of this one. So now that they're here at the archives, wherever possible, we try to move the records into these white archival envelopes. And they're much roomier and generally much better for the records. So what else can you find in a probate packet? Well, sometimes you can find birth and marriage certificates because people had to prove who they were in order to gain their inheritance, particularly women who may have married. And sometimes you find very unique artifacts in the probate packets. And one of my favorites I'm going to show you now. This is the last will and testament of Cecil Winch, who was a soldier who went off to World War I and unfortunately lost his life in Gallipoli. And he penned his will on the back of the family photo that he carried with him to war. And to me, it's just a poignant reminder of the death and grief that that generation suffered during a horrible time in our history. But don't just take my word for it. If you'd like to go looking for a probate packet for someone in your family, head over to our website, put their name in the search box on the homepage, and don't forget to add the word death. If you have any trouble, have a look at the probate guide on our website under Research A to Z, or you're welcome to give us a call or drop us an email. Anyway, it's time for me to get back to work and of course the box I want is right up on the top shelf. It's lucky I'm not afraid of heights. See you next time. So let's talk about Kramer's probate packets. So we're going to talk about three probate packets which span over 100 years from the 1860s to the 1960s. The packets are typical of people of their time and their roles, but they're also special because of who they are. And each of these people have had, I think, quite an impact on Kayama. And the first is Michael Hindmarsh from the pioneering, who's a pioneering landholder and justice of the peace and really significant in the development of Kayama, including through his involvement in establishing agricultural societies. His probate packet is very typical of probate packets and it's quite straightforward. His wife and three of his sons were the executrix and executors. So these, and then you find the typical things that you'll find in a probate packet. There's an affidavit of death, an affidavit from each of, in this case, the executrix and the executors, a petition for probate to be granted and an affidavit of publication. And then there's his wonderfully detailed will of seven pages. It was made in 1866, the year before he was died. He divides his property and his stock among his family. So this is the first page. There would originally have been 
quite possibly ribbon and a wax seal there. So I've just cut out a few bits to show you. So starting up the top here, this is just an example of how he divided his land up amongst his sons. All that piece or parcel of land containing 20 acres, three roots and 24 perches situated in the county of Camden to Gerringong, being the land sold as Lot 27 in pursuance of the government proclamation on the 12th of December, 1846. So there's, as you can see, there's an also further down, there's an end. So three parts of land and it's unto my son, George John, his heirs and assigns forever. So there's a section like that in this seven page will for each of his sons. And then on the right hand side, he's got an agreement at the time of his death or the time of making his will with some of his sons for some of the stock that he owns. And that will continue in the period that it was said that it would continue. And then after that, it will be set, divided amongst the children. So Michael Hindmarsh's will was quite formal. It would have been written for him, but with his you know, decisions. Um, whereas this is the will of Joseph Weston that we talked about not long ago. He wrote his will in 1907 and it was used in the distribution of his assets, but it wasn't probated. His estate was divided among his children as set out in this great handwritten will. Like Michael Hindmarsh's will, it's clear much thought's gone into it and how the business would continue. So he's revoking other, all others. This is the last will and testament to me, Mr. Joseph Weston, journalist of Coma County of Camden, New South Wales. Day that it's made. Hereby bequest to my daughter Mary, the elder, and Eleanor Pamela, the younger, the one and three quarters of an acre of land in Terralong and Minamara Streets, Kramer, together with the two story dwelling house. So basically, they get the house. Um, the land which abuts the newspaper and printing business is left to another son, and he puts these brackets in, I suspect, later or possibly when someone had to sign it to say that it was his will. Um, he has gas shares, he divides them amongst his sons. And then basically the land building and appurtenances, also the type machinery, et cetera, of the printing office connected with the printing and publication of the Comer Independent, I bequeath to all my children, as mentioned above, on the condition they shall, to the utmost of their ability, assist each other in carrying on the business of the office for the general benefit. So he's given this thought, he's divided up his estate, but he also wants his business that he's built up to continue on. We then fast forward to an era of dollars and borrow pens. And this is a will that Charmaine Cliff, who was born in Coma and attended Coma Public School and Wollongong High School, wrote. Charmaine Cliff was a writer, including novels, essays, short stories and scripts. She died at really quite a young age in um, a couple of years after, in 1969. So this is the will form. So if you picture these two pages being the outside of the will, inside there's a place for you to write your will and a bit more information about how you should go about it. So she's just basically sat down with um, the person she decides to appoint as her executor, who's David Allen. He's a solicitor from Allen, Allen and Hemsley um, and leaves all of my real and personal estate now to come to my husband, George Henry Johnston. And in the event of him being himself deceased to their three children equally, to Martin, Shane and Jason. Very simple, but um, did its trick. So these schedules from within the probate packet explain some of the more detailed valuations or lack thereof. So I noticed that there was no detailed list of furniture. So um, didn't own any jewellery of any value apart from that listed in the attached valuation and all of the furnishings at 112 Raglan Street apart from the ones we'll look at in a moment were owned by her husband. 
Then the other personal property, which is the estimated value of copyrights held by and future royalties due to the deceased in respect to books written by her, provisionally returned at a dollar. And so basically they were going to talk to the publishers and literary agents and look at estimates. There's nothing further in the probate packet. And this is something that's quite common with writers. I think that people are unwilling to sort of speculate on what might go beyond. And that, you know, includes Miles Franklin and Dame Mary Gilmore, that what can't really be measured right then at the time isn't measured. So there's a certificate of valuation. And in this case, it's for her interest in the property that they owned in Mossman. It's a two story brick house. And then you can see on the left hand side that this is her furniture, which really is the writing furniture. There's a Remington Quiet Writer typewriter, an Olympia portable typewriter, which presumably sat on the maple desk with open shelves and drawers, and in the three door steel filing cabinet. And then she had a couple of items of jewellery, all of which in total um, was worth $106. So probate packets, really simple to find. You type either death or NRS 13660 and the person's name into collection search. All of the probate packets that we hold are listed online and that's something that we've achieved in the last couple of months. So we're really excited about that. None of the files are digitised, but there is a copy order service for 53.80. And of course, you can come up and see that in our reading room, Tuesdays to Saturdays, but do remember to make an appointment first. So I just wanted to thank you for joining us to talk about Kayama and for your contributions, which, and I hope there's some more. Make sure you have a look at the Kayama Archives in Your Town webpage. Remember ours is a scrolling website. So when you go to the Archives in Your Town website, uh, webpage, scroll down. There's a link from the news box on the homepage.